Two things are hukim, decrees, and this stuff, mishpatim, ordinances. Uh, hukim are generally referred to as the things that God tells us to do that we don't really know why we're supposed to do that. Um, a lot of them have to do with um, being a copy of a model of something in heaven or for a heavenly reason but not for an earthly practical reason. Mishpatim, the ordinances, are generally considered to be the things that are earthly instructions. How do you deal with justice? How do you deal with laws among you? How do you maintain order in your civilizations? Um, and this parsha is about the that first big set of those ordinances, those mishpatim that God gives immediately after the Ten Commandments. Um, in particular, the uh, beginning of this portion starts with the word and. And these are the ordinances. And we're supposed to take from this the idea that this is very connected to the Ten Commandments that were just given to us. These things are nearly equally as important. They're all part of the same thought process. Those were the commandments and these are the ordinances. Um, these tend to be considered as kind of a clarification of some of the things that the commandments are supposed to be. So we are told not to kill and not to lie and not to steal. And these ordinances tell us, if you found someone who did steal, what do you do? Um, if there was death and we're not sure whose fault it was, what do you do? Um, if someone did die by accident, how do you handle these kinds of problems? They're to help us understand, given that we're not supposed to do, do or not supposed to do these ten big things, how do we deal with all of the maybe complicated situations that arise around that. Um, we start off with rules about how you are to deal with if you have slaves and servants among you, specifically if you have uh, servants that are Jewish or ser servants that are not Jewish, and what do you do with these sorts of things. There are, interestingly, there's not really any language in here that is condoning of this activity. There's also not really any language that's condemning of it either. There's a lot of the words if. If you have a servant of this kind, this is what you should do. If you have a Jewish slave, this is how they should be treated. Uh, and in general, the principle in all of those instructions is that even the lowest and the most degraded among you, even your slaves and servants, need to be treated with respect. Even the lowest among you are part of God's creation, and that needs to be understood, and they need to be treated accordingly. Um, we're given a bunch of rules for how to deal with murder, accidental or otherwise, injury to others, and assault. Um, and rules for how disputes about these sorts of things are going to be adjudicated. Um, these are things that we would consider both criminal and civil types of lawsuits. What happens if someone, uh, if you accidentally break someone's leg? What happens if you slip while watching someone's house for them? What happens if, oops, you trusted me to watch all over your cattle and they all died and that's my fault, what do we do? Um, rules for dealing with damages from animals or as a result of borrowing or as a result of a lot of other potential uh, legal problems and how are you as people supposed to understand them and how is the judicial system of the people of Israel supposed to work. Um, we're told uh, right after that that we are supposed to be sensitive to the desperate. You know what it's like to be a stranger. You know what it's like to be desperate. So you are supposed to be sensitive and understanding to the strangers and the desperate among you, to the orphans and the widows, and to the strangers in your midst. Um, we are told we're supposed to keep, if you loan each other money, those loans are supposed to be interest-free. Um, and if you have to take collateral for a loan, that collateral must be understanding of need. You can't take a man's only shirt as collateral for a loan. What else is he going to sleep in? Um, these are all instructions about being considerate and understanding in the way that we have dealings with each other. Um, and then there's clear instruction to maintain integrity in the judicial process. That when you're trying to figure out who is guilty and who is not, that you be discerning and that you have wisdom in these matters. That you do not fall prey to false witnesses or people trying to trick you into certain judgments. That you won't be deceived by false uh, convictions or you won't take bribes. That you will be fair and just and make sure that if we are going to dole out uh, these penalties that God has assigned, we make sure we do it the right way and to the right person. We don't want to be convicting the innocent. Um, it's another, we now have another reminder of Shabbat that not only do you get a Shabbat every seven days, but the land also gets a Shabbat. Um, every seven years you are supposed to give the land a rest and your animals should also rest on Shabbat and the land that you are farming needs to rest every seven years that it can recuperate as well. Uh, God institutes the three big pilgrimage festivals, the Feast of Matzot, the Feast of the Harvest of the First Fruits of Your Labor, um, which takes place in our calendar sort of in the summer, and the uh, Feast of the Ingathering at the End of the Harvest.
Um, and right after that, there's a, like a one sentence thing about atta attacks on this idea of don't boil a goat in the milk of its mother. And from this we get all of the very uh, legalistic things about not eating meat and dairy together and all the ways that the rabbis want to blow up this sentence. But it's a single sentence tacked onto the end of another thought. And generally speaking, it would seem a little bit strange that that thing at the end of the sentence is a lot more important than all the things that were at the beginning of that sentence. Um, after this, we have God giving a promise of a swift delivery into the land, which turns out takes a very long time. But part of this swift delivery into the land includes a reminder that the people of Israel are supposed to be faithful to God. I will deliver you into the land. I will remove all the people that are there in your way. And you should be faithful and remember me. And they don't do a very good job of that. And as it turns out, this swift delivery took a very long time. Um, and the people of Israel, immediately after this, they respond, all that you have said, we will do. And the word that they use there when we say do means we, we, we hear and we will obey. We, will, we have heard and we are going to act on what we have heard. It's a very strong word implying that there is action going to be taken. We have heard and we will do these things. Um, at this point, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders uh, go up the mountain. Uh, and what it says is they saw the God of Israel and they lived. And the rabbis get very uh, confused about this. And there's a whole lot of arguing as about how is that the case. Because we're told several times in other parts of scripture that no man can see the full presence of God and survive. But it turns out that Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders of Israel all went up the mountain and did not die. And they saw the God of Israel. And not only did they see him, they hung out and had lunch. They sat down and they ate and they drank and they partied. Um, and there's all sorts of arguments as to why this is. And some rabbis will say that, oh, they did sin in seeing God and they were punished later. And some rabbis say, oh, no, they were ex there was exceptions to the sin of seeing God in this case. But what stands out to me here is the idea that not only did they see God, they stayed and hung around him and they ate with him. And they ate and drank on the mountain and had a good time. And it, it speaks to the character of God of what does he desire. He doesn't really want to be a pillar of fire on a mountain with a big booming voice that everyone's afraid of that you stay down there and he stays up there. God wants you to come have lunch. God, God is calling. He wants to know about lunch. <laughs> he desires to be a God that's with us. The same way the original intent in the garden was that God would come hang out with us in the afternoon. Not that he stayed up in the clouds and we stayed down here and we didn't talk and he would cast commandments down upon us from on high. He came and walked with us in the afternoon in the cool parts of the day. He wants to come hang out. He wants us to come to him and hang out with him. Um, and it is right after this that the end of the portion comes and that's what I'll be chanting from where after all of that happens, Moses goes up to get God's instructions on the, what will be the form of these tablets. And there's a big cloud on the mountain for six days. And Moses goes up the mountain and stays there for 40 days and 40 nights. And who knows how it is that he ate and drank up there, but God provided for him. And that is where the portion ends. And I'll be chanting those last uh, four passages. But I think the thing, at least this time reading through, that I wanted to remember is this idea that God doesn't want to be a cloud on a mountain. He wants to be someone that we're hanging out with.